All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Thursday, March 10th, 2022. Thanks for joining us today. Glad that you're here. Say hi when you get here. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and you've said 2022 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 28 years and you're starting to rethink or even reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture and they're all the need to know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, If you're not familiar, if you've never joined us for Context and Clarity live before, we're streaming out to six places around the internet today. So it's great to have all of you with us and uh, make sure that you say hi when you get here. As usual, I am joined by my co-host, Catherine McPhail. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Jeff. It's very loud here, so I'm just gonna keep my comments to uh, a minimum. Was there no music today? Sean says there was no music. We do. On Thursdays, we we lack music. Oh, we got to fix and, that. I'm a big yeah, fan well, of music. I always assume that everybody in the audience is singing on Thursdays. <laughs> because it's Thursday. Because it's Thursday, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see who's with us today. I see uh, John Jones is in first on my screen from Westport, Connecticut. Sunny but chilly Westport, Connecticut. Hi, John Jones. Welcome. Um, you being first in means that you are the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub. And if that's something that you're not familiar with, that's the award that we give out. What Number one, in honor of a friend of ours that passed away earlier this year. But it's the, uh, the award for the first person in. We also give away an award for the person that has traveled virtually traveled the furthest. So um, that's one of the reasons we like to know where you're joining the conversation from. This is a literally a worldwide audience. We uh, have people joining us from all around the world in real time, uh, maybe from Anaheim all the way around to Australia. So we give an award for the person that's furthest away from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where I am. Uh, we call that the Crocheted Yacht Award, uh, just as useful as a crocheted bathtub. So We'll but see bigger. how that. <laughs> but actually, it's very similar to a bathtub, isn't it? I mean, both essentially a bathtub. Yeah, uh, but the the uh, the goal is sort of opposite. One's holding mm-hmm. water, and one's keeping water out. I guess you're right. Both crocheted. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nicole says she's heard us singing in Clubhouse, and it could be pretty scary to hear. Which made me think, like maybe we should come up with a theme song. We should all sing it in Clubhouse, and that's what we should play when it's opening that should be the recorded theme song yeah and we'll put some instruments with it yeah it'll be good okay we'll start working on that you can you work on that (laughs) we we we, um so christian is the second person on my screen he's joining us from ithaca new york Uh, christian has been the the uh, keeper of the birthday list and every time it's someone's birthday on clubhouse we start out our conversations every weekday morning over on the clubhouse app at 9 a.m eastern and uh, when it's someone's birthday christian gets the group started the context and clarity choir as we call it um we get get started singing the most um horrifically beautiful version of of uh, happy birthday you've ever wish you'd never heard so um, that's where the singing references come from. The Kurt is Kurt is messing with us today. He says he's he's joking today from YouTube. He's usually joining us from Twitch. Welcome, Kurt, from YouTube today. Uh, Scott Thrift is in breezy San Francisco on Twitch. Chucktown Sean is joining us. No music today, as we said. Uh, James Petty. Hi, James from Upstate New York. He's joining us there's snow on the ground where he is he's probably standing out in the snow as he's watching this from youtube nicole there's probably no snow in arizona hans welcome back from portland maine mark lepage from waxaw north carolina chris novelli is joining us from massachusetts barry reed joining us from scotland okay there we go we've got to get we've got to say that because um the that would put barry in the lead for the crocheted bathtub award or no the crocheted yacht award i'm sorry 
Who's up? Or the strike now. Urban Collab Architecture. They're only joining. They're not joking. That's disappointing. Oh, that is disappointing. That's Kurt. What has, that's Kurt. Yeah, I thought so. Up, up no, Florida, I just bought Michigan. James Petty's book today. Oh, excellent. Uh, twice, by the way, James, I bought it on Kindle and I got a, um, have a paper le- paperback coming Sunday, but I couldn't wait till Sunday to start reading it. So I had to buy the Kindle. Also. There you go. There you go. James is a former uh, Context and Clarity Live guest. Uh, if you want to know uh, about architect and developer type issues, we've had both James Petty and Jonathan Siegel as Context and Clarity Live guests. So you can, uh, the easiest way to find those episodes is to go over to the Entree Architect YouTube channel. And uh, there's there's actually a playlist for Context and Clarity. You can find all of the past conversations that we've had. And when this conversation has ended, uh, it will be over there on YouTube and and on Facebook and all the places as well. Um, if you are joining, especially if you're joining from Facebook and you're commenting from Facebook, you're joining you're you're joining us from either the Entree Architect Community Facebook group or the Entree Architect uh, Architects and Allies group. Both of those are private groups. Both of those have, uh, of course, uh, uh, privacy uh, rules, which say that your information cannot leave Facebook. However, if you're commenting and you would like to show up on the side of the screen, like others are right now, and you're not currently, there is a URL at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now, chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook. If you take that, type that into your browser window, within two clicks, you can give Facebook permission to talk to Restream, which is the uh, platform that we use for these these broadcasts, these simulcasts, and you will start showing up on the side of the screen, just like Mark LePage is there, just like Benita is. Hi, Benita. Thanks for the wave from Atlanta. Um, just like Chris Novelli is. He says, James, the James Petty interview was hands down the most energetic discussion to date. All right. Action packed. Very good. There's a, there's a nice uh, testimonial there. So if you're over on Facebook and your comments are not showing up, chat.restream.io slash FB will do the trick. Go there, make a couple of clicks, give Facebook permission, and uh, you'll start showing up. And And we want you to do that because you're welcome to this conversation. You're welcome here. Your voice is welcome here. We love having your questions and your comments as we talk to our special guest. And with that, our guest has been back there in the green room for a while. We're probably close to running out of green M&Ms by now. Uh, they're, they're always very popular with our backstage guests. So I think we probably ought to just get to it and introduce them and bring them out. <laughs> Our guest today is an advocate and an architect and a leader. She's had a non-traditional path to licensure in the U.S. She works outside the traditional firm model, and she's a catalyst for change that elevates and mentors others that share her experience. She's the founder of the Powerful Speeches platform, a co-founder of the Immigrant Architects Coalition, a past president and co-chair of AIA Long Island and the AIA Long Island Women in Architecture Committee, respectively. She's uh, one of the Long Island Business News Top 50 Women in Business and the Senior Manager of Facilities for the Nassau County Board of Cooperative Educational Services. Graciela Carrillo, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here with you. We're glad that you're here. Um, and, and I've got to tell everybody that was a really long list of accomplishments and involvements, but that's only about half of it. Um, but there are some, some really important things on that list and it really sets us up, I think, for a great conversation today. Um, if you've been around context and clarity the past couple of weeks, you know that just serendipitous, serendipitously, honestly, um, we've had basically two weeks that uh, many of the conversations have fallen into the realm of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Last week, we talked to Pascal Sablon. Um, she's president-elect of the National Organization of Minority Architects. Fantastic conversation. Today, we're going to talk to Graciela Carrillo, um, obviously very involved 
in the the realm of of um, women in architecture and immigrant architects, the the certainly within the realm of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, with a fantastically different bent to the conversation today. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I mentioned earlier that we start out every weekday morning on Clubhouse and Graciela joined us this morning at Clubhouse. Our guest, our, our afternoon guests don't always join us in the, uh, the coffee talk. So that was fantastic, first of all. But one of the things that you said this morning, and we, I told you this backstage before we get started, was sort of the, the last piece of the puzzle that brought it all together. You volunteer, um, you found things, you mentor people, you do all of these things. And you said this morning that your mission in life is helping others. And when you said that, it was, it was kind of the, the light bulb moment, you know, that, that, like I said, that pulled it all together for me. It's like, that makes total sense. Can you tell us a little bit about that mission and, and maybe how that became your mission in life? That's a long story and uh, <laughs> I would stay here for hours. Uh, but no, in, in summary, where do I start? So I came to this country already as an architect, of course. I did my bachelor in uh, Colombia, in Bogota. And so I came here with a work visa and just trying to uh, go through all the immigration, you know, challenges, starting with a work visa, trying to stay here because I didn't want to go back to my country. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people that had to leave the country for safety reasons, not because I wanted to. Uh, so that was very challenging. And then trying to go through the licensing path and you know education because to me it was it was very clear that if I wanted to have better uh, positions or or opportunities here I needed to have a degree from this country like to me and maybe I was wrong my degree from my country didn't really mean much because nobody knows what the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana is so I was like, I, I need to enroll, not only because I want to become a better professional, but I need a degree from this country. And that was also specifically thinking about my green card, how I'm going to make the case that I need to be here and that my employee needs me. What are my qualifications that are better than Americans? So I went through the education process, the licensing process, and all of that struggling because I really didn't have anybody to advise me on what to do or guide me. So I made a lot of mistakes. I spent a lot of money that I didn't have to uh, because my my company where I was working at that time um, sponsored my visa, but in other words, I paid for everything. You cannot do that now. Le, le, the, the law has changed that now you can't do that. You can't tell the, the, the firm, oh, I'm going to reimburse you. And, you know, if you hire me, I'll pay you. No, you can't do that. It has to be coming from the firm, which that's how it should be. But at that time, immigrants to be able to open doors here, my, my approach was like, I pay for it. Just hire me. I just need a job. Uh, so going through all that and, and, and struggling, when I finally made it all happen and I was successful, then I realized how many other people are going through the same and they don't have that help that I never had. So that's how I started figuring out, you know what? We need to 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 help others. We need and so if I if I met someone that was going through the same process, I would like help them. Then in 2019, uh, my other two uh, co-founders of the Immigrant Coalition, Yun Yun Loko, he's um, from Asia, and Shahad, she is from Iraq. Um, we got together and we, we started the Immigrant Architects Coalition because of a session that we put together for the conference in Vegas for AIA 19. And when we did that first session, we had like 70 people in the room. It was amazing. It, it, and then we realized that help and that support and that group is needed. There is no group that helps. There is women in architecture. There is small firms exchange. There is international groups. But 
a group dedicated to help and mentor immigrants that come here with an with a degree from their own countries didn't exist. So that's why we created that coalition and we have talked at many, many um, con conventions, like state conventions, national, uh, but also schools. So students that are going through architecture that are international students, and th eventually they're going to they're gonna get through the same challenges that we, we go, because it's not only from the professional standpoint, it's cultural bias. It's, it's a lot of different topics that uh, we could talk about about that forever, of course. But we that's our main goal is to create this support network. And we're also in the middle of developing some guide, guidelines that local chapters, AIA chapters, um, can have so they can distribute uh, for any immigrant that is coming to this country. And like, what do I do now? This is like the one-on-one guide on what are the resources out there? What should be your path? for a successful professional career. Uh, so that that's part of our initiatives to, to put something together. And we're working with a bunch of um, volunteers um, that are putting together these guidelines. So eventually we'll, we'll release them hopefully this year. I, I think th that that's, first of all, thank you for the, the story and thank you for the background. I think that that really sets the table uh, for a conversation that can go a lot of directions, obviously, um, you're you're seeing a need and and you're answering that need, basically. And um, for those that aren't familiar with context and clarity, um, we have these context and clarity lives every Thursday afternoon. But in in the middle of all of these, we have conversations every weekday afternoon, and so we we craft those conversations around the theme that we'll talk with our guest about. So the last two weeks, we've been talking about inclusion and equity and diversity, and and um, yesterday we uh, talked specifically about the gender gap. And I know that you're working on something right now specifically related to pay in the gender gap. Um, could you tell us about the survey? Yeah, so the survey, we have a group that I know, you know, John, she created the Women Collective's uh, Facebook group, which is huge. I mean, I think we are 4,000 now almost. Uh, and one day, one of the members, which I know she's in Washington, uh, Diane Lee, she posted a question. She's like, oh, I'm about to, to start interviewing, but I, I was wondering, like, salary-wise, what are the ranges for these types, like, this specific um, experience? And then everybody started chiming in in that post, like, this is what you should ask, or this is what we're doing here. And then I was like, why don't we just create a survey and we develop a database where we can have this data and... So let's say you are gone, because we talk about that on the Immigrants Coalition. We talk about that too, salary. Like I came to this country and I'm like, how much is that I'm supposed to get paid? Like, I don't know nothing about salaries, you know? So it, where are those resources? So uh, we said, okay, let's do, let's put together this survey. We receive about 800 responses in a matter of like one month. And we had... We didn't have all the states, but I think we had close to 40 states, 38 states. So we have a large representation of the country. Of course, this is this is all women in architecture. Uh, and so we what we did is we divided the salary into what what's your position. So is, if you're a, a business owner or principal or project manager, designer, whatever. So we, we have different um positions we also have of course these positions depending on the location so statewide um if you have license if you don't have a license if you have a master's you know so all these criteria so when someone let's say is in massachusetts and they want to they are in the in the process of applying for jobs well, they have an idea on depending the position, the, the, the years of experience, education, what are the ranges. But we did that just for women, just to know what we're getting paid. But we know that men get paid 
more than women. Uh, and data shows that it's about 16 to 14% difference in salaries. And when I'm talking about difference in salaries, it's just private, you know, private work. Municipalities, of course, that doesn't exist. Municipalities, the, the, the salaries are disclosed. They are public. You can know who's making what in which position. In the private sector, it's a taboo. You can't ask how much you make. Uh, and that's something that when I came to this country, that doesn't exist in Colombia. I don't know of other countries in South America. But you can ask your friend, how much are you making in that company? I want to know. Maybe I can apply, you know? It's open conversation. When I came here and I made that question one time, I was like, no, you don't ask that. That's like insulting. And I'm like, why? I mean, you, I couldn't understand that. So the, one of the reasons of the survey, too, is to open the conversation. We want to be transparent, you know, not only we as, as uh, employers, but employees. And the second phase of that salary, now that we started the conversation, is to open the survey to the male, the men, so we can then have apples to apples. And then we, because you go to the AIA salary survey, you go to uh, Glassdoor, I think it's called that other one. There are a few uh, platforms where you can find uh, salary data, but it's not specific. It's just very broad. And like I said, we know that women get paid less. And I'm not saying all the time, but the majority of the time, women are paid less than men. And the difference, it could be up to 14, 16%. So when do we start opening that conversation? So I can know that me, Graciela, I'm making this amount of money here, while my peer that has the same education, license, experience is making this difference. So that's the goal that we want to achieve with the second phase of the survey. We're just taking a break. That took a long time. We are all volunteering. We all work. We all have lives. And here we are, like, putting together Excel spreadsheets and, and, and charts. And so it, I told Diane, you know what, let's just take a break. And then we do the second phase later on. But that's the main idea. We want to open the conversation so everybody is transparent about salaries. Well, and, and you mentioned this a few minutes ago, you know, it's, it, it, and it's this recurring theme, I guess, over the past couple of weeks too, is it's understanding, right? If, if the information is not out there, if it's, or we, we talked about this in, in a different context last week, if I've never been exposed to an experience or a history or something that somebody else has, how do I know about it? Yes, I can, I can go out and research, but sometimes I don't know what I don't know. And I, and that's one of the things that, that I really like about what you're doing. And you mentioned, you know, you're, you're right now you're focused on the women's salaries and next the men, right? So, so then we're getting back to that idea of the gender gap, but you mentioned immigrants as well, right? We, these are, there are an awful lot of things that, aren't talked about. Um, and, you know, I brought this up yesterday when we were talking about gender gap, there's a reason that, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying it's completely nefarious, but there's a reason that some people don't like change it's because, you know, this way benefits them. Why would I, why, why would I want change if it starts to not benefit me? That's a terrible way to say that, I think, but, but, um, but I think it's easier to keep status quo if that's all we know. If we don't, if we don't have that comparison that you're talking about. So I love, I love that um, that you're doing that, and I'm sure it is a lot of work. It's an amazing amount of work. Have Have you done any work to figure out why, or do you know why women get paid less than men? You know what? That's I have read a lot about it, and. 
It could be because women, sometimes they just leave, you know, the profession. A lot of the members here, and I'm talking about Long Island, uh, we get a lot of the younger generation that just graduated. And then when they start having kids, they have to leave because daycare is ridiculous expensive. So I totally understand why they take care of the kids and then seven, eight years pass. And now how do they come back into the workforce? Some of the chapters, not Long Island, but some of the chapters, I know they have programs to help women that left the profession because of maternity uh, to come back and how to, how to provide them the resources you know, the, the, the education, because you leave for seven, eight years, things change so, so fast. Uh, so it's like starting from scratch again, and that shouldn't be like that. But I think that also has to do with the, the culture of, of the firms. Like, why don't you provide the, and now that after COVID, that everybody has a chance to work remotely, the firms are fully capable now of working satellite, you know, you don't have to go to an office, but how do you change that mentality that allow women to stay home, work, be productive, but also take care of the family, but not only women too, men too. Like I look at Canada and other countries in Europe, the woman ha the, the, the women have one year of maternity leave and then the next year the men has it, you know, that's, that's, much deeper conversation, politics, everything. But we got to look into into that in an equal... We're, we're fighting for equity. We're fighting for, you know, inclusion. But we have to think about the men too. They, they should have the opportunity to stay home, take care of kids, and be providers. So that's, that's to me, that's the equality that we need to, to achieve. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Like Ruth Bader Ginsburg spend a lot of her time working for men's rights to take care of their children or to stay home and let their wives work and be covered by her insurance and things like that. That wasn't the way society set it up at all. You know, so it goes, yeah, it goes both ways. Men might want to have the opportunities that they're not able to have right now. So, well, but that still doesn't explain why we get paid less. Excuse me, Jeff. No, it, it doesn't at all. Um, but I, but I think, the points that you're both making are really important points. You know, it can't be, it's, and I, I mentioned this yesterday when we were talking about gender gap, this is not a quote unquote women's issue, right? It can't be half of the equation, right? There's another half of the equation. And so, um, you know, if, if part of the answer or, or all of the answer is there needs to be equity in who's able to stay home and, you know, what happens when the kid has the flu and all of that. Um, there, there, in some cases, uh, there, there's two people involved in that, two adults involved in that. And, um, I think, and Grace, you, you mentioned it as a, as a cultural thing. I think that's exactly right. It's baked in, it's been baked into this culture, the U S culture, I'll just say for a long time. So there's a lot to unpack. Um, getting back to may maybe to the, the salary issue in the salary survey, um, it does remind me that even Pascal last week, Pascal Sablon brought up Rosa Sheng's work going back a number of years when it was called, uh, the missing 32%, which if I'm correct, is the 32% of women that disappear from the profession, um, usually around having kids and things like that, that's now expanded into equity by design. But how do you, you said the next step of the, in the salary survey is to survey men. Can you imagine once you have the, the men's responses and the women's responses, what, what's the next step? Once you have all that information, the, the next step is, and, and I'm, I'm agreeing with, with Michelle here. She made a comment in the chat that women don't ask for more. And she's totally correct. 
uh, we actually in, in our Women in Architecture Committee, we have lectures on how to ask for more. Like we need to, you know, give them that uh, confidence and security and empowerment to go and sit down with your boss and tell him, I want more. Tell him or her, I want more money. I'm, I deserve more. So uh, going back to that, the next step is that you as a woman, you see that disparity and that will empower you to advocate for yourself because that's something, believe it or not, that not everybody is capable of advocating for themselves. And that's a very important part for a professional or a person in general. If you don't speak up, you're lost. Nobody's going to do it for you. You got to take it on, onto your own, you know, hands. So that to me is the next step that when you see those numbers and the disparity, because I saw it, like I saw it before I saw the disparity. So every year I would sit down with the principal and I'm, I want more. I brought this to this firm. I got this jobs done. I got all this value. I want more money. But if I didn't do that, nobody was going to do it for me. So that to me is what we need to do. Awareness of where we are so we can advocate for ourselves. Yeah. There's, a, th there's a story going around through social media, uh, and, and I forget where this hiring manager posted it, but let's just say it was on, on LinkedIn or somewhere like that. A hiring manager posted that they had just – they had just uh, extended an offer to a candidate and the candidate essentially, you know, to your point, these weren't the words that they used, but had not advocated for themselves. They had not asked about the, the salary range or all those things. And the candidate accepted a position and an offer just as it was given rather than negotiating. And so to bring it back to the hiring manager and, and this person got, got dragged all through social media because it was, it was a little bit crass, I think. Um, but they posted, it's like, listen, I just, I just gave this person uh, an offer of $85,000 when the budgeted range was 115 to $130,000. I don't have time to hold people's hand and teach them how to negotiate. And that's, you know, that, that harshness, I think, is why they get dragged uh, through social media. But I think that is a lesson that points to exactly what you're saying. If you do not advocate for yourself, um, but, but going back to what you said, if you don't have that information that you're collecting right now, you don't know how, you don't even know if you're in the ballpark, presumably. Uh, I just wanted to point this out because James Petty says that his wife liked Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide by Linda Babcock. So maybe we should all read that. I will read it for sure. Yeah, me too. <laughs> there you go. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, James. Uh, Graciela, you mentioned the Women in Architects Committee, which you're a, a co-founder and, and um, uh, co-chair of that committee in, in AIA Long Island. Can you tell us more about what you're doing in that committee and, and what the goals are there? Yeah, so that committee, <clears throat> just to give you like a little bit of background, um, the chapter is a 75-year-old chapter. Uh, before me, it had only two women as presidents. And of course, I was the first Latina president. So you could see how the membership, you know, gender gap is. So in 2017 or 18, I believe, I attended the Women Leadership Summit, which is the national women's meeting at that time. We were 450. I was so empowered by just looking at all these women around me and learning so much from them and just being inspired by them that I came back to Long Island and I'm like, we got to do something. We don't have a women in architecture. We don't... I. When I went to the meetings, I only had maybe two women attending our monthly meetings. I'm like, where are they? Like you said, the missing, you know, 32 mm -hmm. is like they, they were missing. So we co-found, we, we started the, 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 
comedy with Ever Sulker. She's she's really amazing and very supportive. And the goal or the mission of the committee was pretty much that to empower, support, and create the network for women in the in the chapter. And since we created that committee, now we have these meetings where 30 people are women and five are men. So it really made an impact. It really created that safe space. Uh, for the women to to share their struggles, their challenges, their victories too, uh, but it also it's always inclusive of men. This morning, someone was asking, or I don't know, yesterday I think, if if the women in architecture allow men men to join the committees, and well, the committee itself will it's a women in architecture. Men really, it's not that they don't belong there, but. They are going to feel like, what I'm advocating for women. We do have men coming to our events all the time because they are supporting us, but they also want to share all the knowledge with us, you know? So it's not that we are not allowing them to participate. Yes, we do, and we encourage them to participate. Uh, but what what it, what it the, the ultimate goal of the all the women in architecture committees is just to provide that space where we can... Uh, talk about other things that in a regular committee meeting you don't talk about. And that, that also leads a little bit more into the powerful speeches platform that I created, which is pretty much highlighting, you know, and, 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 and just showcasing all the women in architecture around the country. But that was just a, a creation that I did because of COVID, I was like, there's so much out there by the, all these different amazing committees. Let's put everything in one page. It, it was just an events page where I was just posting all the women in architecture committees events so anybody could go and just sign up since everything is virtual, it's very easy. But then after that, uh, I started creating more um, pages com compi compiling or putting together initiatives uh, that are led by women. So podcasts or resources, organizations, the salary is there too. So it's just a platform for women to show what they're doing and all the amazing things that they can contribute. Well, and I think it's a wonderful way to to elevate those voices, as you said, and that's that it's also a nice serendipitous thread that has run from last week into this week as well um, with what Pascal talked about in her work and what you're doing in your work. And it, and it reminds me, right there, men can be in the room for the, uh, the women in architects committee, but the point is we're, we're elevating voices and we're elevating accomplishment. You talked about celebrating accomplishments. I think that's extremely important. Um, and I think I would encourage, um, you know, again, I say this, I say this, um, number one, to, to keep my, my self in perspective, uh, and also let everybody know, I, I understand I am the middle age, the proverbial middle aged white guy in the room. I need to hear more of these voices. I need more exposure. I need to hear more of these stories. And that's why I encourage um, all the men in the community, in the audience and everywhere to think about attending and getting involved in these because where, how else? Number one, where else are you going to hear the voices? How else are you going to learn about it? And what else are you going to do to support these voices? and to support these accomplishments and, and uh, everything that Graciela is talking about. I think it's important for us to, um, to, to, uh, to step up, I guess is, is the way I want to say that you have, you know, g going all the way back to, to the beginning of our conversation with your, your mission, um, of, of helping others. And I, like I said, at the beginning, I listed off a, a, a long list that's only a partial list of the things that you're involved with. Um, you you talked for a little bit about Las Vegas and AIA A19 and the the uh, discussion that has has spread from there. I guess with the the uh, Immigrant Architects Coalition. Are there 
are are there specific um is there a specific focus to either the women in architecture or the immigrant architects coalition that is most important or is everything equally important what do you see right now i think it's is two different ways of helping others with the immigrant coalition it's more um i would say it's more towards professional help but licensure that's what okay. we based our our help more because it's very difficult to go through the licensure process when you come from another country with your degree from another university in another country um and also like adapting to live in this country if you're coming from somewhere else where the culture is completely different so how do you you know how do you manage the communication the bias uh the salary conversation advocating is is all these topics so that group is more focused on mentoring pretty much we get call i get calls pretty much every week from different people around the country they just need advice and and we have that conversation sometimes i do it once a month with them just to help them along their path but that's i would say is mentoring uh, like the the main focus on that one with the women in architecture um it's more like provide the not the voice because we all have voices and and we've been empowered over the past few years uh but just to provide more fellowship and and i think mostly is to help all those women that are out of the out of the uh, the the workforce because they take care of the family and then they come back so when they come back it's at, as as a very uh, as a later stage in their lives so it it's more of that like provide that that support network um to to help you in overcoming any obstacles that you're going through and and my my uh inspiration is is because of everything that i over had to overcome over the few past years uh working in a male predominant environment uh being the only woman uh technical and of course immigrant so how do you overcome different scenarios and obstacles to to be successful or to be a resource for others to improve themselves and and you've spent a decade you know, volunteering, a lot of it being through AIA. Um, what would it be like if everybody in the audience right now were volunteering somewhere, were mentoring somewhere? What what would what would the profession be like if everybody was involved in in um I, I'm not saying at the level necessarily of Graciela Carrillo, right? There's there's a lot there, uh, a lot there that you're involved in. But what if everybody did something uh, in terms of volunteering and and uh, mentoring, what 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 do you think that would look like? Uh, are you okay? I got a red signal here. Reload. No, it's we're, pay, we're no, pay no attention. It. I'm okay. just dealing yeah. <laughs> dealing with a couple of trolls. <laughs> so, uh, oh my god, it would it would be so different, you know? Maybe it would it would be more the the roadway of becoming a licensed architect or if you don't necessarily need to get your license not everybody needs to get your, their license but just the roadway of becoming the professional that you want in life would be much easier if you have the support of others i always tell people you're not alone on this just find people that you can look up to you know find your mentors and don't just have one mentor you need several mentors and not only professionally but in life so 
because that that's what we are we are a community and as a community we need we need to help each other and i think if if there was uh you know in your mind you just by nature start helping others that you see that they are sort of like following your steps things will be more productive and more successful for everybody for firms for individuals is like a no brainer i completely agree and and i think i think you're a really great role model for that one because i think it's it's easy to to see how you've how you've decided to and and where you've decided to get involved right you you said it a minute ago um you're the only woman in a firm you know the only technical position um held by a woman in a firm you're also an immigrant and if we look at your your record of volunteerism if i can say it that way it reflects that exactly so what did what's what piece of actionable advice do you have for somebody in the audience that's going okay how do i get involved where do i get involved what what do they what's step 1 for them I would say find your group, whatever it is. It could be AIA, it could be USGBC, it could be CSI, it could be... There are so many organizations, Habitat for Humanity, um, engineering organizations. Just find your group and, and just go from there. I don't think I would be the person that I am right now if I didn't put myself out there the way I did. And this is this is something from someone that is or was super shy. I hated talking to strangers, spe- especially because of my accent and communication skills. I hated to like communicate with others because I would I always thought that they were not going to understand me. And now I actually embrace that because as soon as I open my mouth with my big strong Colombian accent, First thing that I get is where are you coming from? So that's like a, you know, icebreaker. So I, I just said, just put yourself out there. Even if you hate, you know, networking or getting involved into large groups, because sometimes people are intimidated by that, just force yourself to do it. And, and that's how you can start, you know, developing those soft skills that nobody teaches us how to develop them. I I have a question. Just how long have you been? How long did it take you to develop all of this? How long have you been working on it? I wouldn't say that that long. It really started like the click around two thousand. I would say seventeen. Okay, it, well, it's good to know. It's not. It doesn't take that long to help people to build up a you know a group, a community, and be helpful. Yeah, um, M- Maria. I have to close that. Okay. She says, um, can you speak about some of the challenges that you've encountered and how have you handled them? Well, the the challenges I encountered at the beginning of my career was, for instance, the, the, the gender, you know, challenge. I was working for an engineering firm, um, do, doing a lot of construction management, a lot of engineering, and that's a heavily male predominant uh, field. So when I was exposed to the contractors and the other consultants, it's like I hear when they, the, the women said, oh, oh, you're here, can you bring us coffee? Nobody ever asked me for coffee, but I felt that person in the room. I felt like if I would have, if, if I said something, they wouldn't take it seriously. And I was the manager. So I had to, you know, I, I just I just had to put myself in the in the mindset that you know what you're doing and it's okay also to mess up. You know, that's something that I tell everybody. If you make a mistake, just be upfront and say, I made a mistake, we gotta fix this, it's all my responsibility, and I always did that. So as I did that, people learned, okay, she's also learning, but she also knows what she talking about and how you that's how you gain respect in the industry uh, so that was sort of like and of course yes the the language barrier but all of those obstacles over time you overcome that uh, from a leadership standpoint it's just 
it doesn't nobody tells you how to become a leader it just goes to me very natural or in an organic way it's just how you surround yourself with others um how you connect with people i think that I connect very good with people. I love people. I love to talk to people. Now, not in the past, I would be like in the corner, don't talk to me. But I love to listen. And when I listen, I learn and I can relate. So I put myself in that same situation and that's how I connect I connect with people. So I think those things are, are very important. And um, that was one of the ob- challenges that I that I went through my leadership uh, time. It was just that uh, communication and and uh, my own personality that was blocking me to become the person that I wanted to be. I don't I don't know if you feel the same way, but I th- I think a lot of times we we have these hang ups or these blocks where we think oh. In order to be able to lead or to help or or to mentor, I have to be an expert or I have to be this person that knows everything. When in reality, what a lot of people are looking for is someone that shares their experience and is a step or two ahead of them because they're more relatable than that person that is that that expert or that you know that well-known person or something like that. Um, that's something that I would encourage everybody. If, if you're asking that question, you know, how can I, how can I help or how can I lead or how can I mentor when I'm only this, or I'm only at, you know, this position, first of all, throw the only out, right. I'm, I'm at this position. There's somebody that's a step behind you that you're paving the way for. Um, that's the person that needs your help the most, I think. Uh, I don't know if you you feel the same way about that, but in in my experience, uh, that's been pretty true. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and uh, and I look up to people like I I see those characters that I'm like, oh my god, I want to be that person, and I try to you know convey and and get the help and the resources to achieve that. That's that's what. That's what we all need. Just try to relate to someone that you see in the future what you want to be with your own, you know, goals and missions in life and and try to follow that path and, and get help from that person. You know, I think that's also one of the things that I appreciate. Uh, and we were talking about this before we go live. One of the things that I love is with Context and Clarity Live, I immerse myself for about a week in someone else, right? The person that we're going to talk to on on Thursdays. And I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you, Graciela, is I'm able to look at everything that you've done and see your journey and see your path and understand, you know, how you've gotten to where you are. And I think that's an important lesson for people as well is when you see someone, when you see a Graciela Carrillo or, or whoever it is out there that you're looking up to, first of all, understand that they didn't start where they are today. And with an excellent role model and an excellent example that we have here today on Context and Clarity Live, look at where they started and look at the steps that they took. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier with Graciela because she's volunteered here and she's co-founded this and, and you can, those steps are very, very visible. But uh, I think that's a danger too, as we look at somebody and go, oh my gosh, look at, look at what they do or how they do it or the quality of whatever, but that's today, right? It wasn't like that a year ago or five years ago or, or, you know, whatever, um, whatever their journey has been like. You, um, I, I realize now <laughs> that we've suddenly reached the top of the hour. Um, so, so we'll, we'll wrap this up, uh, as, uh, as soon as we can. But, uh, one of the things that we've talked about some this week as well has been not only non-traditional routes to licensure, which really applies to that, uh, immigrant architect experience, but also, uh, non or, or I guess jobs, positions, roles outside of 
the non-traditional firm and, and over the past, has it been about a year that you're in your newest role? One year. You are, you're, you're at right at a year. So you're the senior manager of facilities for the Nassau County, Nassau County Board of Cooperative Educational Services. So you're outside of, of a, of a traditional firm, certainly. Um, is is there something that you especially like about um, not being in a traditional firm, or you know, how, what's what leads you? What led you to the position that you have now? So back in Colombia, uh, before I moved here, I was working for the government. So I was in the in the governmental side, and that's why I came here. <laughs> so I started working for a consulting firm, and then. And then I realized I want to move back to the governmental side, you know, to the public sector, because at that time I was thinking I want to make a larger impact, you know, not only as a leader, but I want to make more impact. Like, yes, we design projects, we manage projects, but when you're in the public sector, you have the voice, you know, and the power to to lead the projects and help the community the way the way you want to, and uh, because of AI involvement, this opportunity um, appear with the executive director of facilities at NASA Boses. His name is Anthony Fierro. He's actually one of my AI Long Island members. We were putting together these uh, school design um, webinars with Long Island and NASA Boses, where we wanted to start talking about new design for schools and how the, the education has changed. So between them and AI Long Island, we collaborated. And through that, this position uh, appeared to me. And then I start thinking about it. And I'm like, NASA Boses, uh, the their main um, community base is special education. They We, we own about 13 schools of special education. So it is all these kids that have tremendous disability. Um, you, you, it's very, very, very um, sad the, the type of kids that we have in our schools. But by me working at the facilities department and managing the projects for these kids, it completely like fulfill like my whole mission in life that we were talking at the beginning of the conversation of helping others. I'm helping these kids to have a better place to learn, to rehabilitate, to get their treatment that they need. We have kids since they are like four or five years old till they are 21. So it's a whole experience and how can we provide them a better space and education to become eventually independent from their families or how can we help them into rehabilitation? So it, it's, um, it's not a traditional um, architectural path, uh, but as an architect, I can put my skills into helping the community by, you know, enhancing all these facilities and how we bring uh, into the future educational set the facilities for for kids with special ed. And we also have um, technical schools. We have two technical schools and one art schools. So we have different trades in the technicals. And I'm working right now with NAS, with my work. I said still NASA bosses, like they are my collaborators, uh, to put together architectural programs in our technical schools, because in Long Island we only have five, I think I count them, high schools that have architectural programs in in their curriculum, and we have a scholarship at the chapter, and sometimes we struggle to get applications because not too many high schools provide architectural programs and kids don't even know what architects do. So I am working uh, with Tony on putting together a curriculum. Hopefully this fall will, will open and hopefully we'll get the interest from the different school districts and we can start an architectural and interior design 
um, program for NASA BOSIS. That's amazing. That's, that's all, um, it's all just amazing. And it, like you said, it brings it all the way back around to that, you know, your, your mission in life, like you said, helping others. Um, Graciela, I really appreciate you coming to Context and Clarity Live and talking with us about uh, everything that you've been involved in, but I, I think even more so, hopefully inspiring us to get involved in some way in mentoring and, and leading and, and paving the way for somebody else. So um, thank you very much for this conversation. No, thank you, Jeff and Catherine. This is a, a great space uh, for all of us to, you know, to have our voices translated into others. And hopefully we can inspire others to to just get out there and and do more. Everybody does a lot here in this room, but I know we all can do more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's there's always more that can be done. Uh, and, you know, we've got to be careful about that, too. But uh, uh, that is uh, it's a very, very important point. Uh, to all of you out there in the audience, thank you for joining us. Thanks for all of your, your uh, questions, and your comments, and the side conversations that are going on. That's one of the beauties of this format that we use is uh, we try to get you into the conversation, but also inspire the conversation and and allow space for the conversation to happen, um, even when it's it's in the uh, the little column on the right hand side of the screen. Thank you all for this, um, and I say this say this every week. Thank you for making context and clarity a thing, because if not, we would not have this opportunity to talk to Graciela today. So thank you all for uh, for making context and clarity a thing. We uh, next week for context and clarity live, we're going to go back to a very uh, maybe future tech topic next week. I know we kind of blew some minds a couple of weeks ago when we talked with George Bileka about designing in the real world and in the metaverse. Next week, we're going to talk with Fatima Monfred. She's an architect in Spain um, in real life, and um, she's also heavily involved in designing metaverse. Uh, projects and in NFTs. So we're going to talk more about metaverse and NFTs next week. Um, that would be Thursday, March 17th. So join us next Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern for that. Until then, of course, we will every morning, every weekday morning, we'll be over on Clubhouse for our coffee talks and inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group with topics and conversations related to the week, to the theme of the week. This week, obviously, we've been talking about non-traditional paths, non-traditional jobs, gender gap, all types of topics around that. And uh, tomorrow, we'll talk about um, non-traditional paths to the profession. So join us for that 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. Again, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Catherine, for co-hosting this with me. Um, even though you've got the, <laughs> you've got the workers right above your head. Yeah, they are, they're quiet for the moment. I don't know. Can't wait to go see what it looks like. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it's very architectural in a way, isn't it? Um, everybody be well. Keep yourself well and safe. It's a, there's crazy stuff happening in the world. So please take care of those um, that mean the most to you. Uh, take some time tonight to breathe and relax and find some way to rejuvenate because we're going to do this all over again tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate all of you. And I hope that I will see you all somewhere sometime soon. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>